Today we're going to talk about resources, activities, and costs. And congratulations, this is your last lecture. By now you're intimately familiar with the business model canvas. We've talked about value props, customer segments, channels, customer relationships, revenue streams. We jumped ahead and talked about partners. And right now we're going to talk about key resources. And for key resources, the real question is, what are your most important assets to make your business model happen? Let's see what are some most important assets. What are the most important things that are required to make your business model work? For every startup, the thing you're always worried about is money, finance. How do you get the company started? Can you do it on your credit cards? Do you need a line of credit? Is it a small business loan? Or then physical resources. Do you need a manufacturing line? Do you need machines? Do you need cars? Do you need vehicles? And how about intellectual property? Are patents critical to defending your position? Or is it customer lists? Or is it people? And then that kind of gets us into what are the key human resources you need to make this happen? Is it the world's best scientists or programmers or engineers? Is there a specific area in the country that has a concentration of them? And so when you think about resources, some of these are just kind of natural. Uh, oh, yeah, we'll hire a bunch of engineers and we'll have a building and et cetera. But actually, you could think about this strategically. Gee, is it possible to have headquarters in one place like Silicon Valley, but great engineers back in our country, uh, somewhere in Finland or Chile or Russia? Or, gee, is there a physical manufacturing plant best located in the United States? Or do we need to put it in a place of, for lower cost manufacturing? And so all these resources are the things that you really need to think through. Even though on day one they might not seem important, it just gets to be a bigger and bigger problem over time if you haven't actually approached this as a strategy, at least giving it a couple of cycles uh, when you start your company. So there are four critical resources you need to think about. As we just talked about, they're physical resources, financial resources, human resources, and intellectual resources. Let's take a look at each one of these. For physical resources, these might seem at first kind of the obvious is uh, your company's facilities, and that is office space, company location. Are you in downtown Palo Alto, or are you in Ann Arbor, Michigan, or are you in Delft in the Netherlands or Santiago? Where's the best place to locate uh, your company's headquarters, and where are you going to do most of the work? The second part of physical resources, where are you going to get the supply for your product and services? So, for example, if you're making silicon, um, where, who's going to be your silicon wafer supplier in, in, in the value chain? Or if you're making steel, where are you going to get the iron ore? Or are you going to need thousands of square feet of warehouse space if you're going to set up a distribution center? Now, what's really interesting is this kind of obviously affects where are you going to put your company facilities? Maybe you want to have your manufacturing facility next to the key supplier. Or you might say, okay, we understand uh, they're distant and we can manage that remotely, but you need to actually think through not only this relationship, but as you'll see, the relationship between resources and the partners part of the business model canvas, because some of these supplies and services require deep relationships, not just ordering out of a catalog, but true partnerships. Now, the other thing to just remember is many physical goods, if you're in a physical channel, are capital intensive, which is a fancy word for saying doing a startup like Tesla or SpaceX is very different than doing a iOS or Android app. Uh, the amount of resources you're going to need for physical goods just are dramatically different. And when you're thinking about the finance component, you want to really think about what happens after year one, year two, etc. How do you scale this business? And in the uh, second decade of the 21st century, a good number of clean tech startups and life sciences startups are now encountering this phenomenon. Is it works great as a startup, but there's a valley of death for capital and scale. And that brings us to financial resources, is how are you going to get this startup off the ground? If you're doing a web, mobile, or cloud app, it's actually quite possible that you could get the company started with your credit cards, friends and family, crowdfunding like Kickstarter, local angels, that is, uh, investors who are not professional venture capitalists but might make some small investments. Again, if all you need is a laptop, an Amazon Web Services account, you could be off and running developing an app. But just keep in mind that when you actually do the financial calculations, that might be great to actually code the app. 
But how are you going to create customer relationships and get, keep, and grow your business? And so financial resources actually gets you back to thinking about all the demand creation activities and customer relationships and the cost of your channel as well. So while you could get started here, it's interesting to start pre-computing what other amounts of capital I will need later on in the life cycle of my company. If you have something in a physical channel or something in the enterprise that requires millions of dollars uh, to start, you're more than likely to approach venture capital firms or corporate partners. So not only can you get money from corporate partners, but in the United States, there's some government financing that's available that, uh, particularly if you're coming from a university, the first place I would look is for what are called SBIR or STTR grants, uh, and they could be as large as half a million dollars to commercialize your company or your technology. Also, the Small Business Administration in the United States offers grants to small businesses to start their companies. In your country, there might be the equivalent uh, government funding. Now, once your startup is up and running and you're generating orders and revenue, there's some other alternatives. So, for example, you might be able to go to a bank and have them finance the lease of expensive physical equipment. If you're buying tons of computers or vehicles or manufacturing equipment, you might actually be able to get what's called a lease line so you don't have to pay cash for them. The second is, if you actually have purchase orders from customers, but these customers don't pay for an extended period of time, 60, 90, 180 days, you could actually take those confirmed purchase orders to people called factors. And factors make a business out of kind of um, lending you money on that purchase order at a discount. And so if you need cash, factoring is a normal part of financing in certain industries and segments. And then finally, if you're buying expensive components, typically hardware, in building your system, the vendor clearly wants to sell that equipment to you, but you might not have that cash up front, or cash is more important than your mother right now in your startup, and so you're trying to conserve it. You sometimes can actually get the vendor to finance or defer or loan you the money to buy their own uh, equipment, and that's another way to kind of preserve your financial resources. So take a look at this list of financial resources. Friends, crowdfunding, angels, venture, etc. Which of these would you use for funding resources, and which would you approach when you have an existing company and you need operating capital? So put the right ones that match into the appropriate column. So it's pretty clear that if you were raising a round of capital, going to friends and family, or crowdfunding like Kickstarter, or angel capital, or venture capital, or corporate partners, all kind of makes sense for financing. Also, going to the Small Business Administration or getting SBIR grants also fit into the financing account. But for operating capital, that is, money you need when your company is an ongoing concern in generating revenue, well, lease lines uh, make sense, factoring, vendor financing. And what's really interesting is you might also get operating capital from government grants as well, and corporate partners might also fit there. So those two actually went uh, into the correct category. Or surprisingly, of course, venture capital always does follow-on rounds, so this was kind of a trick question. You could always get more operating capital in subsequent rounds uh, from venture capitalists, not only corporate partners. Just remember that VCs will invest more money uh, to get more ownership of your company. Another key resource are people. We sometimes use a fancy word of human resources or HR, and I kind of think of people in a startup as two separate categories. One is finding qualified employees, and the other is for you, the founder. How do you find mentors or teachers or coaches and, or advisors for you, and what's the difference between all of those? Well, let me start with the last first. Mentors, teachers, and coaches it, advance your personal career. If you want to learn a specific subject, you find a teacher. But if you want to hone specific skills or reach an exact goal, I suggest you hire a coach. That is a specific subject as a teacher. Specific skills is a coach. So for example, if you want to learn something more about large metadata architectures, you could bring in a teacher or take a class. But if you want to hone specific skills, so like how to give a great presentation or how to manage people, you hire a coach. But the one that sometimes founders forget is if you want to get smarter and better over your career, 
You want to find someone who cares enough about you to be a mentor. And mentors are very different than teachers or coaches. Mentors are actually a two-way street. The only people who tend to want to help you are those who implicitly think they can actually learn something from you in addition to liking you. So most of you in your career will actually go on to be mentors. But think about the type of people who you've encountered in your career. Implicitly, you've been giving something to them while they've been giving something to you. The last category in mentors, coaches, teachers are advisors. Now, advisors are people you need to help advance your company's success. Mentors, teachers, and coaches were about your personal success as a founder. But advisors really kind of bring generic advice, sometimes to you, but also to your VPs and your staff, etc. So what you want to have is experienced advice to help you figure out whether your vision is a hallucination. But getting specific, you want to put together as early as possible an advisory board. And that's really the idea of expanding your circle of accumulated wisdom past just your investors. A mistake that founders make the first time is thinking that their venture capitalists or their angel investors are your advisory board. Yes, they're your advisors, but they're also your boss. And so you want to be very careful about limiting your advice to just that circle. And they may not have the specific domain expertise you need. So make sure you're expanding your series of advisors available to your company. And typically that's done by offering them a small percentage of equity in exchange for some of their time. The last part about human resources are qualified employees and the culture you set for your company. You know, qualified employees are the difference between a good idea that never went anywhere and a billion-dollar firm. You know, it gets said a million times, but it's very true. A employees in a B market will always win over B employees in an A market. Hopefully, you're A employees in an A market, and you'll be figuring out where to put the bags of money. Uh, but you want to always hire people better than you. And if that's threatening to you as a founder or if that's threatening to any of your employees, the system kind of collapses from there. You want people who actually can see further than you or have skills deeper than you. And that's the sign of a world-class founder. So the last piece I want to talk about for resources is intellectual property. And there are great law firms who can give you tutorials. There's plenty of stuff on the web. But the types of intellectual property, shorthand IP, you want to think about are these. There are five. One is trademark. And trademark means what can you protect is branding, like the Nike swoosh. And the examples could be marks or logos or slogans. Other type of intellectual property could be copyright. An example is creative or authored works and expressions. You can't copyright ideas, but you can copyright software or songs or movies or website content. The other one is trade secrets. Well, I don't want to patent this because if somebody's going to read the patent, they'll figure it out. So you might decide that you're going to protect it in a vault, just like the Coca-Cola recipe is supposedly kept in a vault in Atlanta, and it's non-public technology. Also, your customer lists might kind of fit in this uh, category, or some secret formulas necessary for a final element in your product. Two things that startups run into all the time are contracts or NDAs, which stands for non-disclosure agreements. You know, what's protectable is in the contract, that is, you specify it or, or somebody making you sign it or offering you a contract or an NDA specifies it. And examples are technology and business information. Now, by the way, before we go forward, this is one point I want to mention. Founders sometimes naively believe that they could protect their technology from uh, investors or potential investors by making investors sign a non-disclosure agreement. That just doesn't happen, and it's a naive view of how to protect your technology. My suggestion is, by the way, don't put your source code, your firmware, or, or your deep insight in the first presentation because you're never uh, going to have somebody push a bag of money at you across the table over a series of PowerPoint slides. In fact, if an investor is interested and you're now in meeting two, three, or four, and they say, listen, for us to really proceed, we need to have you open the hood and let us or a consultant take a look. The next question to ask is, well, if we do that and it meets these following criteria, is there an investment or not? And if the answer is yes, then you can make them or at least require an NDA uh, because they've gone down the path of interest with you and are serious. 
The last piece of intellectual property is patent. U.S. patent law has changed in some important ways in the last year. If you were familiar with it, it's nice to get updated again. What's protectable are inventions. Uh, and typical examples are new technology. You've invented something new, some hardware or algorithm or software, etc. Getting a patent is kind of important. Just to recap, trademark protects branding and marks. Uh, it gives you the right to prevent others from using confusingly similar ma marks and logos. It lasts as long as you use the mark. The more you use it, the stronger your protection. And there are country-by-country country laws that kind of define trademark, and it's optional to register it, but it has significant advantages if it's approved. Copyright uh, just gives you the right to prevent others from copying or distributing uh, or making derivatives of your work. And you could copyright more than just technology. It's what we do for songs, books, movies, etc. It lasts practically forever, but doesn't prevent independent development. Someone else could uh, do something independently and come up with something quite similar. You could register it as optional, but it's required to sue for infringement. And sometimes you see copyright labeled on the bottom of something with a little C with a circle. That means somebody is claiming that this is their original work and uh, uh, suggesting that you need their license or permission to make a copy. Trade secrets, as we talked about, you want to keep that uh, secret and it has an economic value. No registration is required. It's basically how safe do you think um, your idea is going to be inside your company protected with armed guards in a vault. It can last for as long as you take reasonable steps. Contracts, again, it's everything that's in the contract, no registration process. You have whatever protection is defined in the contract. Now, patents are interesting. A patent is a government is giving you a monopoly by preventing others from making, using, or selling your invention, even if the other's infringement was innocent or accidental. And this has to be a non-obvious invention. It has to last, uh, the protection lasts for about 15 to 20 years. And there's a whole application and examination process. And uh, it's worth you getting up to date and understanding about patents early on. Very rough rule of thumb is if you're in Web 2.0, you probably shouldn't be spending a lot of time on patents, though there are exceptions. If you're in life sciences, in the other extreme, you shouldn't leave your bedroom uh, without a patent counsel walking you out. There are some rules of thumb for each industry um, and each market, and you really need to spend at least an hour before you start your company understanding what rules uh, apply. So let's take a look at the types of intellectual property. And what I'd like you to do is uh, help me understand, if we look at the column on the left, trademark, copyright, trade secrets, contracts and NDA, and patent, and match up what's in the protectable column and the example columns to the correct type of intellectual property. So let's take a look at the answer about which intellectual property matched what is protectable in examples. So for trademark, what's protectable is branding, and examples are marks and logos and slogans. For copyright, it's creative, authored works and expressions, not ideas, and the examples could be software, songs, movies, or website content. For trade secrets, what's protectable is anything, secrets that you think have economic value. And examples are non-public technology like the Coke secret recipe or your proprietary customer list or some kind of algorithm or formula you didn't want to patent. And for contracts and non-disclosure agreements, what's protectable is whatever you and the person uh, who's going to do the deal with you have defined in the contract and is enforceable in the law. Um, and so you could uh, have technology, business information, etc. as examples. And finally, patents. So what's protectable are non-obvious inventions. And examples are new technology that haven't uh, been previously patented or, or applied for. And you have to be first. So now we finally come to the last part of the business model canvas. We've talked about value props and customer segments and channels and customer relationships and revenue streams and partners and resources and activities. And now we get to cost structure. And it's kind of ironic. We're getting to the last part of the business model canvas that could actually put us out of business. Because remember, costs need to be less than the revenue stream. At least, if not on day one, over time, or else you haven't built a profitable and sustainable business. So let's take a look at costs. If you really think about it, there are two general types of costs. One called fixed costs, that is, how much do my building cost, how much are my employee costs, going to show up every month 
month to month that don't move. The other things are, what are my most important costs? Uh, are there resources from the resources part of the business model canvas? Are there activities that are most expensive? Did I have to do something with my suppliers? And so I really want to understand what's the cost structure uh, to operate the business. What are my fixed costs? What are my variable costs? What are my most expensive resources? What are my mo most expensive activities? And I want to add them all up and make sure that the interaction between cost and revenue has costs less than my revenue. And again, on day one, you could say, no, 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 we're not going to make money for the next year, two, or three. And as long as your investors agree and you eventually make money and can prove to yourself and them you can make money, it's okay to have costs being a little more expensive. But you and your investors need to be in sync about costs versus revenue from day one. This is something you don't want to surprise investors about. One of the interesting things about costs is that in the old days, costs and revenue, the minute you started your company, your investors said, oh, we know how to track all this. We want you to fill out an income statement, a balance sheet, and cash flow. And we want you to do accounting from day one, which gives us visibility and forecast, etc. The problem is, is these were execution metrics. Existing companies execute known plans. You could, in fact, do all the spreadsheets you want for every board meeting, but in fact, they're not worth the paper they're printed on. But you and, and your maybe rent a CFO or accountant have spent a lot of time. Now, understand that your VCs or investors, if they're professionals, need them for their investors. But what you really need to be doing is working with your investors and your management team is to derive the metrics that matter. So if your investors really want to see income statement, balance sheet, cash flow, well, great, you could give them the fantasy documents all they want. But what you're really interested in is trying to understand what are the metrics that matter for your business. And I'll give you some examples. In value proposition, what was the product cost? What was the market size? What share could you take? What's the competition? What are they charging? And customer relationships. All the get, keep, grow metrics, some of which we talked about, some of which we'll discover. What were the customer acquisition costs? What were the conversion rates? What were the lifetime value? These are key metrics. This is a lot more important than what's revenue in year four because you're just guessing about that. But these are numbers you're going to be living with every day. And by the way, what market type are you in? If you remember from our earlier lectures, if you're in an existing market, that's a different type of revenue curve than being in a new market. Do your investors still agree? What are your operating costs? What are the basic fixed and variable costs of the business? What's the cost of your channel? What's the margin the channel needs? How much are you going to have to spend on channel promotion, shelf space, any other channel extra charges? And then again for your revenue stream. Do you now know with certainty the average selling price, the number of customers per year, achievable revenue, how long it takes to close a sale? And here's the number that actually intersects with one of the ones that your investors are worrying about all the time. How much money are you spending per month, often called burn rate? And not only are you, how much are you burning per month, but when we just calculate that out, when will you run out of money? All these numbers are ones that you, as founders, need to have on the top of your head. No startup has 300 numbers. There's probably somewhere between 5 and 15 that matter. And maybe you could be the exception. But you, as the founder, need to know all these parameters. And in fact, the exercise is, see if you could go up to a whiteboard and list them. And if you can't, understand that that's your job in searching for the business model. And when you know these numbers, the spreadsheets fall out of these. But trying to do it ab initio from some guessing spreadsheet just is some fantasy. You need to get these metrics that matter known, searched, understood. And don't worry, they will change, but the whole game of the business model canvas and the customer development process was for you to find them out firsthand and to experience them, not to have them happen to you. One of the other interesting things that we have the teams do, and the Jersey Square guys was a great example, 
is to start to put together u the unit economics, the metrics that matter for both revenue and cost. So they were going to take the annual subscription revenue, 199, and see what their business looked like. So they assumed that the cost of a jersey with 25% off to them, that is to Jersey Square, was $150. They think they'll be able to rent it five times during the year, that their shipping cost was about $9, their cleaning cost a dollar, processing cost a dollar, and their customer acquisition, that is ac customer acquisition and activation cost, $25 a team. And, and so if you take a look at their unit cost, you add all this up, it's $230. But their revenue was only 199 Why would they do this? Because they were going to lose $31 a year? Well, remember, this is to acquire a customer. But what you need to look at is the customer lifetime value. What happens when this customer renews for the next year? Well, in the next year, you don't have that jersey cost because you're still turning that jersey. He might have only used it two or three or four times. And you don't have the customer acquisition cost because you already acquired that customer. You still have your shipping, cleaning, and processing costs, but your unit costs are now $55. And if you get 60% retention, your net for those customers now who stay longer than a year is $86. Now, you could immediately see some of the fallacies in, in these first back of the envelope calculations is, well, what if they use the jersey seven times in a year? You're actually buying more jerseys per year and actually you're losing money in year two, three, and four. So you might want to be limiting the number of times you can actually rent the jersey in a year, or you could just be uh, changing your revenue model. Uh, but this is a good visual way to start thinking about how to start doing the math for metrics that matter. So now that you're done with the lectures, it's not the end. One of the things you might consider doing is putting together a lessons learned presentation. And this summarizes everything you learned week to week, either by watching the lectures or hopefully getting out of the building and talking to customers. What to do with that presentation? Well, number one is you could post it to the forums, and we'll select the best presentations and put them on Steve's blog. The second is you might use this as a prototype for actually thinking about how to talk to investors uh, and how to talk to other customers. But what do you do next after this class really depends on you. One is it could have been a good exercise for you to decide whether entrepreneurship is for you or not. Next could have been as you've decided whether your idea is worth pursuing or not. And third is, if you have and you still like your team members after getting out of the building and working hard, you could decide that the next step might actually be to pursue this idea either in an incubator, an accelerator, trying to raise some funds, or trying to take the company to the next step. So what I hope is this class gave you a small taste of what entrepreneurship feels like and what are the things you need to do? There's a ton more to learn. Take a look at the rest of the Udacity courses. Uh, take a look at steveblank.com and Alexander Osterwalder's website, businessmodelgeneration.com. And I also recommend checking out startupweekend.org for other events and other courses. And we'll see you when you're a public company.